So today we're going to talk more about elasticity. First, uh, it, I can have, uh, continuing with the, the previous theme, uh, I can have a couple more people introduce themselves, who they are, what they're interested in. I know last time I didn't get anyone, so <laughs> you don't have to if you don't want to. But Does anyone like to volunteer? I can start. Um, my name's Devin. I'm a junior this year. Um, I'm interested in power systems and stuff like that, so engines and efficiency. Uh, but, you know, we'll see uh, where I end up in a few years. Yeah. What's your last name, Devin? Mays, M A Y S. Power systems. So, what do you hope to take out of the class? Uh, how, you, how hard you can push something before it breaks. Very much depends on the material. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks, Devin. Uh, anyone else? Maybe one or two more people? Hi, I'm Laurel Towser. Um, I'm interested in renewable energy and I want to learn how to be a better technical writer. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, on that. So, right, that was the other thing that I was going to ask. For people who have done the lab so far, uh, how has it gone? I've only gotten like two emails with people uh, complaining that <laughs> it's impossible. But, um, it's I, I'm having a really hard time with it. I was hoping to get some help, but I wasn't able to connect to TA multiple times. So I hope yeah. I can connect with you after class. Uh, yeah, I'll have office hours today from 11 to 12. Um, is so the Praveen had office hours Monday 12 to 11 to 12 right were those helpful for people who went maybe um, so I, I thought that um, one of the things we could have cleared up was maybe like how to propagate air and maybe anything like that yeah. Uh, yeah it was kind of unclear about how how to properly do that kind of so to keep and blah 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 mm. Yeah, so there was uh, that law of propagation of error in that I had talked about on last Friday, and I had sent out that error uh, sheet from UNC. Would, was that helpful at all, or even that didn't make things clear? I think maybe if we went through like one exact class, a couple of propagation would have been helpful. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can. But, but it, it's fine. Yeah, I, I could. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good to know. I, I can go through it again before the next lab. Um, I don't have anything ready today, so I'd be making stuff up off the top of my head, which wouldn't go well. Um, but thanks. I, yeah. Okay. Other outside, outside of error analysis. In today's labs or capsules, what does that mean for how we go about turning in the lab today? Uh, just in the box. Yeah. Or to the TA if you can find him, but that's <laughs> likely just into the box. Or uh, I guess you could turn it in here and I can get it to the TA. Or, yeah, if you have it done right now and want to hand it in. Yeah. Cool. Um, other stuff with the lab? Was the template helpful? Very, yeah. OK, cool. Were the notes? So we, I haven't gone through technical writing stuff yet, but I left the a series of notes and instructions on how to write w at the beginning. Was that also <coughs> helpful to through? Yeah. Okay, cool. Like about how much are you expecting us to write like in the discussion section? Uh, so total, I would expect the reports to be around, like without appendices, maybe 10 figures, or 10 figures, 10 pages. Um, yeah, it, like with, with figures and with appendices, it, it'll, it could get longer, I think. We only asked for three figures, four figures, maybe. Um, yeah. Hope. What's uh, how about this? How many people's reports are less than ten pages so far? <laughs> how many are less than fifteen pages? Okay. How many are more than twenty pages? Okay. <laughs> so. Somewhere between 10 and 20 seems like the, the normal number. What's the, how about time, how about time-wise? How much time have people been spending? Less, how about less than 10 hours? 
<laughs> no. Okay. Cool. Uh, less than 15 hours. Maybe. <laughs> oh boy. Less than 20 hours. Okay. Okay. Cool. Has the and the thing that's been taking the most time is the error analysis, or what? What has been taking the most time? The numerical analysis at the beginning, or the just the whole thing? Yeah. 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 We had a, a couple of equations thrown at us to explain how to go through and calculate the theoretical and compare to the experimental only. We've seen all of the steps in isolation. Mm -hmm. Putting them all together and getting the numbers to come out somewhat right is a lot harder than just each individual step. Right. So, right, you had beam theory and you had the experiments, but that, like... Yeah, you can have equations for air propagation, you have right. equations for what kinds of stress we expect where, at what points and why, and how to put all those together to calculate our strains at each given angle. Right. But putting all the pieces together in the right order without making any mistakes, yeah. having not run through an example of that, is right. kind of top order. Because that's my experience. So the recitation wasn't super useful last Friday then? I thought it was pretty yeah. useful. We did a great Okay. Okay. That's good, because that's that the was two, like, the right? yeah. So th that was the the time where we were kind of piecing everything together. Like we threw all the pieces out there, and then that was like the all right. Here's a couple of things. I mean, but that not seen one example work through from beginning to end. It's still a little shaky. Okay. Yeah, um, my thing was definitely that we just wasn't sure what you guys were looking for for the air propagation. So, uh, like, if I say, well, it's probably this, you know, it takes, like, no time at all, or whatever, mm -hmm. but, decided, but then trying to figure out, like, you know, play, like, a mind game, it would mm -hmm. take as long as I think it. So, yeah, I'd like to talk about that, even if you don't have something to play in the day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Would you want to talk about it in office hours? or sure. Okay. Let's plan on that then. Um, okay, yeah. For the next one, we'll try to be more clear about what we're expecting with the error analysis. I guess, oh, because in the lab manual, we just had talk about error and sources of error and think about all of it, but we didn't give like, I thought we listed out potential sources of error, didn't we, in the manual? You give sources, but you didn't really like talk about like how you expect it. Uh -huh. Like for one, one of the things is like you you said like give a table of the uh, prediction strain values. Uh huh. Like should there be like another column with the error like or like a different Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess we kind of left that up to you all. It could be in the same column or like you could split a column into that plus or minus in another column. Uh, yeah. We'll we'll try to be a little bit more thorough with it for the next one. I feel like this question is not as important. What is the template you have provided us? You asked us to include some uh, or many equations. Mm -hmm. Do you expect us to talk about those equations and break them down with each variable? Uh, I mean, not in a ton of detail, but like you don't have to necessarily explain where the equations are coming from because a lot of them we're giving to you you're just sort of writing out like okay for this strain transformation the, the stress is, or strain in these gauges is going to be this um, it would be good to define all the variables so like but I guess we're also defining variables for you in the manual right. so I kind of yeah you sh yeah you should be defining somewhere in text like what variables are like we calculate the stress sigma and the to be whatever based on the load p here's the and then the equation uh, but it doesn't have to be anything much more extensive than that yeah in the appendix you said like don't paste your excel sheets but like notate what formulas go where i was a little lost on like how you would this so you can put Excel sheet data, but if you just put Excel sheet data, that doesn't actually show how you did the calculation in the Excel sheet. Right. So if you can say like, 
here's all the data in the columns, and then here's cell cell one is equation this, cell two is equation this. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. Is that a lot? It also Well, no, 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 because you don't have to, if you're propagating equations down, you don't have to, like, you're just dragging equations to copy over things. Each one is different? Yeah. Can I just throw like the string transformation equation down and say I use this for all of them, or do I need to use the version with each different angle in it? It's a good question. <laughs> so, whenever in office hours today, it would be useful for me to see some of your Excel sheets so I know exactly how much, uh, how scattered things are, and how many different types of equations there are. Uh, I had the TAs go through the analysis, so they would probably, so Praveen would probably be a better person to ask. He's also the one who's going to be, so the, the whole point of you putting down equations in the appendix and your data in the appendix is so that if you did something wrong, we can double check and say, oh, you just missed a two there, and that's why all of your numbers are off by two, and you didn't do something wrong, it was just a typo. Um, and so that's the main point of it. But. How does data and equations in the appendix differ from the data and equations we were explicitly asked for earlier in the write-up? Again, it's, it's mainly to check. So you, you put equations in the write-up, and those are what we're assuming you're going off of. But if there's an error in your code or in your Excel sheets, that putting it in the appendix is how we would see. So just put everything in the appendix again? But or the, should it look different in the appendix than it did in the write-up? Like, are you asking for different information or the same information aggregated? Uh, technically, it would be the same information. But like, if you wrote a code out, for example, mm -hmm. you'd be applying those equations, and you would have different variable names and different ways of okay. calculating everything together. And it's not just like, you, here's the one equation that I'm using for strain, but then like, here's where I'm actually <coughs> using it, and here's the number I got for it. It might be a little bit too redundant. Because I did all of that with the calculator, so that would, should I go back ah. and rewrite out my work so that I can show it in the appendix? or Not necessarily, okay. if you're doing everything with a calculator. It's it's mainly if you have code or Excel sheets. Okay. Um, yeah. But it, in office hours, it would be useful to see how all of you are approaching these things differently so I can get a better idea. Yeah. Do you think it's possible like, for future labs to could post like, an example of what the appendix is supposed to look like? Because uh -huh. that was really kind of confusing to figure out what exactly needed to be there. And like, uh -huh. like a basic, it could be from totally a different project, but like a good yeah. example of appendix of what you're, you're aiming for would help a lot. Yeah, I can, I can post an example appendix from a different lab. Um, for the for the tension lab later. Yeah, I think that should be fine. We'll try to find one from old labs or something. Or at least give a little bit more detail rather than just paste stuff in here. Um, office hours are eleven to twelve for yeah. Okay. Cool. I I I, I warned you all last week. I can't <laughs> But the lab may take a little while, but um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, any other? But I think we need to move on to s actual stuff. But any last comments on the lab before we get started? Uh, oh, the where where the viscoelasticity demo this week is canceled because the TA couldn't. Is, was it stuck in Japan? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. So, let's dive into material. All right. <clears throat> so last week we talked about Hooke's law uh, in 3D. So, uh, isotropic elasticity. Uh, I showed if you take a unidirectional bar, we expect it to stretch out in one direction and compress in the other two directions. If we do that in all three directions at the same time, we can sum all of those things together 
and we get some relationship between stress and strain in those directions. So I can say <coughs> the strain in one direction is 1 over E uh, sigma xx minus nu sigma yy plus sigma zz. So I have to be, to figure out what the strain is, I have to be considering what the stress is in all three directions, because that's going to affect it. Um, for the shear strain uh, in the x and y, which is also um, 2 epsilon xy, just to be extra confusing, uh, where this is the strain in our, in our matrix representation. This is 1 over g sigma xy. Uh, I can repeat this out for all the other directions, the xx and the yy. If yy would turn into yy here and xx here, I'm not going to write them all out. Um, and then there's a corresponding set of relationships for calculating stress. So sigma xx uh, is a big, long, confusing thing unless I apply some transformations and say this is two times the uh, two times the shear modulus times my thing plus my Lemay constant times the <coughs> trace of my strain, where the trace of my strain is xx, epsilon xx plus epsilon yy plus epsilon zz. There we go. So, uh, this, again, I can write this out in, in with the other three components, which I'm not necessarily going to do. I can also say for my shear components, this is uh, g gamma xy or um, 2g epsilon xy. So this is our, our part of our Hooke's Law in 3D relationship. There's then six equations that define all of these relationships, and that can get kind of long and tedious to write out and think about. Um, so it, I'm going to take this and write it out in another form. So first, Hooke's Law in 3D. Was there anybody who hadn't seen this before um, or who wasn't familiar with this? Okay, cool. So, in our in a in a new form. So I remember remember that our our stress now is some matrix. Oh, that's going to be too small. Some we can write out our stress as some matrix, x x, sigma y y, sigma z z, sigma x y, x z, sigma y z, and then this is symmetric. So these are the same mirrored back onto the other side. Um, because of this symmetry, there's actually only six independent stress components. So what I can do to simplify this is I'll write these out now as my six components, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, 4, 5, and 6 with the same things on the other side. So I'm kind of making a triangle here with my stresses. And I'm going to switch this over to another shape. So I'm now going to say my stress matrix uh, is a vector, sigma 1, sigma 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It's a little bit short there. So this uh, switch this different form of my stress is known as a, a Voigt notation. So having stress as a vector instead of as a matrix. Um, and the reason we're going to do this is because I want to use this and a corresponding strain. So I, I can also rewrite strain as that, as some strain epsilon 1, epsilon 2, 3, 4, 5, six, and I want to use these to rewrite my Hooke's Law as a big matrix. Yes? Just, this is just convention, yeah. I don't know why they do it that way necessarily, but that's, because that way you can like draw a triangle and it's a continuous thing instead of doubling back. I don't know. Um, I'm going to point out here that um, when I'm writing this out, 
this is actually uh, so this is actually going to be my epsilon xx y y z z uh, and then gamma x y or gamma x gamma y z gamma uh, x z gamma x y which is also epsilon x epsilon y epsilon z two epsilon y z two epsilon x z and two epsilon x y just to make things extra confusing because uh, remember there's a difference between my the way I'm defining uh, engineering strain engineering <laughs> shear strain and shear strain um, based on the fact that this needs to be symmetric so just to make things extra confusing um, yeah I'll, yeah. Isn't the one from like the epsilon matrix, epsilon like xz and x and like yz though? Like yes. If we were to write out like our three by three matrix, we mm -hmm. use the, the half one, right? Yeah. But now that we're writing as a vector, we use the one. Yeah. Just to make it extra confusing. So so it technically could go either way, uh, but generally, so I'm gonna I'm gonna write this out in a matrix form. Uh, this is what finite element solvers are, solvers are going to be using to, to calculate out strains. And generally, they're going to be using it in this form. It could technically switch either way. You're just adding in a 2 or taking out a 2 um, to these shear components. But by convention, it's, it's generally defined this way. Um, yeah. And so what I'm going to do now is try to rewrite this Hooke's Law in 3D as a giant matrix using these vectors. So now I'm going to say my strain, my strain, which uh, remember is 1 over e sigma xx minus nu sigma yy sigma zz. I'm going to rewrite this as uh, some stiffness tensor, or sorry, some compliance tensor times my sigma, where this is now a compliance and I'm going to use the word tensor here because technically it's a tensor for all functional purposes it's a matrix so don't worry too much about the actual difference for now um, or I can write out my sigma as some C epsilon where this is now my stiffness <coughs> tensor and what that looks like. So now I'm, I'm going to write this out all as one big matrix. Let's scoot this over just. So I'm going to say my epsilon is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is going to be some big thing here. And now a sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, 4, 5, 6. Now I know this is my xx and my epsilon 1. I'm going to bring this 1 over e out for all of them. Um, so I'm actually going to scoot this over. I'm going to bring this 1 over e. I could also have it in there. I know my epsilon 1 relates to sigma 1 as a 1. It relates to epsilon xx relates to yy as a negative nu, also as a negative nu, and then zero for the last three components because it doesn't relate to any of my shear. I can do that for the next one. Similarly, negative nu, one, negative nu, zeros, negative nu, negative nu, one, zeros. Now my shear strains relate to each other based on the the shear modulus, that G, um, but now I, I have, I brought my 1 over E to the outside, so I'm going to use that relationship, uh, G is E over 2 times 1 plus nu, uh, and I'm going to write that in there as 2 times 1 plus nu, and it doesn't relate to the other components, 0, 
2 times 1 plus nu, 0, and then 2 times 1 plus nu. These are also all 0 because my shear strains don't relate to my axial strains. That's a little bit cramped. Maybe. Um, or I can say uh, there's now some S11, S12, S13. These are all going to be zeros. Um, or I guess I'm going to call this S12 also. S12 also, 0, 0. S12, S12, 0, S11, S12, S12, S11, zeros, zeros, lots of zeros in this thing. S44, S44, and S44. Also all zeros. So there's actually only well, four, th three independent constants in here. So uh, two times one plus nu over e, which is my shear modulus, or one over my shear modulus, uh, negative nu over e, and one over e. So uh, this now is my compliance matrix. So instead of using all those, um, I guess, six equations for Hooke's Law in 3D, I just took all of them and rewrote them as one big system of linear equations. Um, and the reason we do this is because it's a lot more convenient to deal with mathematically. Uh, I can do a similar thing for my stress, which is also big and long. Uh, how am I going to write that out? I think I need a new piece of paper to write it out. Uh, but first, how is everybody with that? Is there any questions or concerns now that I've rewritten it in a new form. Is this S matrix after you multiplied it by the sigma vector? Or is that just replacing no. the this, one? This is just all of that. I guess with the E in there. So my, my S11 would be 1 over E. My S12 is negative nu over E and my S44 is 2 times 1 plus nu over E. Cool. Other questions? Alright, so I can do a similar thing now with my stress. And I can say, now my stress is that C epsilon. I'm going to tell you, a, so a note here, uh, I'm using S for my compliance sensor and I'm using C for my stiffness sensor. I don't know why this became the convention. That's just what people do and it doesn't make any sense. But just remember that S is for compliance and C is for stiffness. <laughs> Yeah, so just for later on, know that I'm, this isn't a mistake. It's just just the way it is. I, I don't know. Um, so our, our stiffness tensor, now we can write out as my sigma is sigma 1, 2, all the way down to sigma 6. And then I have some big stiffness tensor now, which is going to be... Um, so remember that equation 2g epsilon xx lambda trace of epsilon, so epsilon xx y y z z. So now this, I'm going to leave this here, maybe that'll be useful. Uh, yeah, so you can see them both. I know my sigma xx is related to epsilon, 1, 2, epsilon. Epsilon 6, there we go. Uh, I know it's related to epsilon xx as 2g plus a lambda. So I have 2g plus lambda. 
Uh, it's related to yy as only my lambda, and it's same with z, and then it's not related to the other three components at all. I have also a lambda, 2g plus lambda, 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 2g plus lambda, uh, and then it's related to the other ones just using that shear modulus. So these are all zeros, these are all zeros, lots of zeros, whole lot of zero. I'm going to call this g, 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 and zeros. I could write this also using uh, using my Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. It just gets a lot uglier. So this S is also equal to oh, E oh, E oh, didn't need to erase that. E over one plus new one minus two new. This big one minus new, 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 one minus new, new, one minus new, zeros, zeros, and then one minus two new over two, one minus two new over two, zero, zero, one minus two new over two and zeros because remember I only for linear elasticity I only need two elastic constants yeah yes it is thank you <laughs> this is they really should have just called it s and see I don't know why they flipped it um, but that's just the way it is thank you yeah, so because remember our linear elasticity, we only need two constants to calculate things out. So now, first, questions on that? Everybody happy? <laughs> Just loving it. Have you have it, have it represented in this form before? Okay, cool. So the reason we're doing this uh, will become more apparent, oh, maybe Friday, maybe next week, when I start talking about anisotropic elasticity. So this is, remember, if the properties are isotropic, so the same in every direction, and homogeneous, so there's no spatial variance. Um, when I have anisotropic elasticity, these aren't all necessarily the same constant. And it's actually really helpful to have things written out in this form, so that instead of writing out six really weird forms of Hooke's Law, I just have one equation, and I know I have a C11, C12, C13, C1, C21, whatever. Um, and so it becomes a lot more convenient to write out anisotropic relationships using this sort of a matrix representation. Um, yeah. So, cool. Let's look at a couple examples to try to make this more tenable. And this is a weird question, but why is it that the, uh, our axial stresses are dependent on each other, whereas our shear stresses are not? Good question. Uh, <laughs> that was actually going to be one of my, uh, well, actually, sort of. So there are materials where they are dependent on each other. But for isotropic elasticity, we're going to assume that they're not. Is that true, or is it a valid assumption? Generally, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it's only for weird single crystals where it's not. So I have a, a variant on that question that I'll ask in a couple minutes in a poll everywhere. Okay, so a couple quick examples. Let's look at uniaxial stress. Stress. So this is our simple case of I'm going to pull on a bar with some stress sigma, uh, and I want to figure out what's my strain in that body. So I know my stress I can write out as sigma zero, 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 zero. Uh, my strain, I can calculate out if I use my, my other big bad equation there that I had written out before. I can say now my strain is equal to uh, one over E, uh, one over E, uh, one minus nu minus nu, 
uh, minus new one minus new minus new minus new one and then zeros everywhere there and two times one plus new and then the same thing going along there and I can write this all out again times my sigma zero 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 so the strain that I get out if I multiply this the strain is then one over e or sigma sorry sigma over e minus sigma uh, or minus new sigma over e minus new sigma over e e and then zero is going down so this is that same uh, result that we started with if I pull a bar I get some response it, it gets stretched out based on the stress over the Young's modulus in one direction and then it contracts in the other two directions based on the Poisson's ratio so that was our this was kind of the, the simple result that we started with when we were driving this whole thing let's look at or that all good everybody fine with that cool uh, let's look at the a different case so let's look at uniaxial strain so uniaxial strain so now I I have a body that I'm going to stretch out in some direction do some strain this way and I'm going to say the strain in the Y and in the Z directions is zero so I only have my strain in the X direction is some strain there sorry and I want to figure out what's my stress in this body so this is actually a, a relevant case but not necessarily something that's intuitive so you can think about this as if I want my my body to stay fixed if I if I had a strain uh, in one direction and these were unconfined I would it would want to contract based on Poisson's ratio but if I didn't want it to contract if I wanted those to stay flat I would actually have to pull on them to keep them in the same spot so how much would I have to pull on them to keep them there to keep it from contracting like it wants to and so I can do that using this uh, using my Hooke's Law in 3D or uh, I guess this matrix representation of that so I can say now my stress is equal to I have that big strain relationship here so uh, 2g plus lambda 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 plus lambda lambda lots of lambdas and, uh, and then G, 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 there's a whole bunch of zeros, a whole bunch of zeros, a whole bunch of zeros everywhere else. And then this I have times my strain and then zero, 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 zero. Because all my other strain components here are zero. So my stress from this, uh, where are we at? I'm going to write this up here just so I don't have to use another piece of paper the end result stress is 2g plus lambda epsilon uh, lambda epsilon lambda epsilon and then zeros for the rest of it so if you remember when I told you about our Lemay constant that lambda this is the reaction force needed to keep a material confined so it's, it's, the, it's the ratio between strain in one direction and stress in the transverse direction so this is where that constant comes in so that that lambda epsilon basically I have to pull on it with that lambda or with that Lemay constant in order to keep the body from contracting like it would want to uh, this constant 2g plus lambda is actually a useful one uh, and that's known as it, it relates to my my bulk wave speed in the material which let me make sure I'm using the right equation yes so there's another constant that I didn't tell you about um, called M which is uh, 2g plus lambda which is how fast a wave propagates in a material so where rho is the density of a material and v is the wave speed the pressure wave speed in that material um, it re this uh, relates to that 2g lambda so this is actually relevant in earthquakes 
So that VP is the wave pressure wave velocity, um, which generally is one of the constants they measure for earthquakes. You have a pressure wave and a shear wave, uh, and the pressure wave comes about because the earth is so big and you have basically a confinement uh, in the transverse directions and it doesn't let the material expand out in or expand it or con con contract in as that pressure wave is going through because the earth around it confines it. So this is actually a, sem a somewhat relevant problem for earthquakes. Fun stuff. Okay, um, I'm going to ask a couple conceptual questions and then that'll probably be all we have to wait for. So now, or maybe not conceptual, maybe uh, uh, some calculations involved. Cool. So, <laughs> all everywhere stuff. So the first question is related to one that just got asked. Why, so in that, uh, let's jump back to our dot cam. Uh, here I have, nope, maybe, maybe it wants to go. There we go. Uh, so here in my stiffness tensor and in my compliance tensor, no? Okay. Cool. Whatever. It just wants to stay there. Um, so in the top right and top left hand corners, I have a whole bunch of zeros there for my, for my compliance tensor and my stiffness tensor. Why are those zero? And what would it mean if they weren't zero? I want you to think about it for like 30 seconds and then talk to your neighbor about it for another like minute or so. Uh, let's pull up a timer. Timer. I typed it wrong. Sorry, that uh, instead of stress tensor, that's supposed to be stiffness tensor. My bad. I see why there's confusion now. Yes. So why, is, why does the stiffness tensor have zero terms? Okay. Go ahead and talk about it with your neighbor for another minute or so. Okay, um, quick reminder that, uh, so I, I will count participation in this for extra credit at the end. You don't need to give a sensical answer, it could just be garbled nonsense, but uh, just to prove that you're actually participating, give something. So who wants to try to explain why, or do you have a question? Wait, so what exactly do you mean by off axis? Is that is everything except for the diagonal from upper left to lower right? So this is, if it wants to stay over there, uh, in my stiffness tensor, there we go. All of these zeros here and all these zeros here. Why, why are those zero? 
And what, what does it mean if they're not zero? So does anyone want to give that a shot? That's exactly what it means. Or, um, yeah, I guess. And in the opposite case, it would mean that axial, axial stress would cause, or axial strain would cause shear stress. So most of the time, when we assume our material is isotropic, we're assuming things balance out. But you could potentially have crystals that aren't isotropic. So you remember FCC, BCC, everything is kind of lined up and in a row. Uh, and forms a nice square. What happens if our crystal is then sheared slightly and no longer uniform? Then if I, you can imagine a packing of, of spheres. If I pushed on this, it's actually gonna wanna kind of shift over slightly. So that axial stress or axial strain would result in a shear strain. So there are, it is possible for certain crystal systems to have uh, non-zero terms in these constants and this is also why we look at it in this form because it, it's too complicated to think about this in terms of all of the Hooke's Laws equations it's easy to just say oh constant C414 has a non-zero value um, but what that physically relates to is the structure of the crystal and how that might change um, we don't have any time left cool so I had another Hole everywhere question, but maybe I'll just ask it next time. Uh, yeah, we'll work on it later. Um, thanks, everyone. Again, I have office hours 11 to 12, and I'll see you all on Friday. Homeworks are due uh, now, I guess. <laughs> if you don't have it done, just turn it into the box. Into the box.